Hello and welcome to the video. This is hopefully a much shorter video than some of the others that you may have seen already, going through what iNav 2.6 is all about. Reasonably high level, but the idea is if you're an iNav 2.5.2 pilot and you're using it and loving it and you've looked at iNav 2.6 and like me, you spend a lot of time looking through all of the release note information, but you're still not completely clear about why should I upgrade? Hopefully, Uncle Lee and Uncle Pavel say hello, Uncle Pavel. Hello, Uncle Lee. <laughs> we'll, we'll cover it for you. Uh, festive greetings to everybody. I hope everyone's having a fantastic Christmas. Um, I'm not going to put time codes down below. This is just me and Pavel having a chat and hopefully putting a little bit of context around those relatively dry one-liners that you can read when you go through the release notes. Now, with iNav, I would always heartily recommend do make sure and have a look through the release notes. The iNav team are really, really good in making sure that everything is documented. If you are uninitiated, the challenge can be that you can read that and still get to the bottom of it and still be none the wiser about why you should upgrade to 2.6. So first of all, Pavel, thank you so much for another Christmas present. I now have 2.6. Thank you on behalf of all of us who fly for you and the other developers putting the hard work in. This one's been a long time coming, hasn't it? Uh, thanks, Lee. Uh, it's not exactly maybe Christmas present because after all it came a few weeks before, a uh, long time, and I'm pretty sure this is how the release cycle of the INAF in the last few uh, few years looks like because we try to release every basically six months, two releases per year, something like that. Fantastic. So we'll get on to what I'm still waiting for then. So I'll have to wait to 2.7 for that. Maybe, hopefully, maybe it'll come you in should. before. It will be awesome. <laughs> we say this every time. It, the next release will be even better. But joking aside, 2.6 has got some big stuff in it. Um, the way I think we just do this, Pavel, is if we just start at the top and we'll kind of run through it. Again, if you're interested, links down below if you can go and look at the release notes. Once Pavel and I have had a chat, if you want to go and read them again, then that make hopefully a little bit more sense. So uh, main features, there's new waypoint types been added, set head and set point of interest. Um, so those are kind of big deals if you're into mission flying. Set heading means you can fly a multi-rotor. Normally the way it works when you're flying a mission, it points and looks at the next waypoint that it's flying to. With set head, you can set it to look in a direction. And with point of interest, it will always be looking at that point of interest. So if you've been playing with waypoint stuff, or maybe you've had a play in the past with things like Ardu Pilot, with Ardu Copter, those are kind of similar Multiwi. things those guys do. Even Multiwi. Because even, even multi we had functions like that, and I now finally caught to what multi we offered like I Woo! don't know how many years ago. That's it. We're, fi we're finally catching up to the 8 bit code that we had yes. eight years ago. Fantastic. But, but, th but that's quite a big deal. It does mean that for those of you that have been looking at iNav on multi-rotors in particular for cinema and video, that's quite a big deal. That's one of the reasons yes, to upgrade. Yes. Next yes, this is another step closer to being, to being autonomous. However, there is still one kind of little problem because iNav configurator does not uh, allow you, does not give you the graphical user interface for those functions. For to use those new waypoint types, you should hand to the head to the third party tools like for example MWP tools yeah uh, hopefully that will uh, configurator will catch up but I'm sure as configurator catches up there'll be more waypoint types and mission parameters and things so it's going it's going to be one of Let's those things so. that it, it'll be like an arms race but what a lovely arms race to be part of um, next one a big deal safe home uh, safe home yes. is in my humble opinion as a uh, fixed wing pilot, INAF fixed wing pilot, this is a massive deal. So before, what you had was the ability to set an offset from home. Uh, I tend to fly in, a, in, a, in an area that's surrounded by trees and I'll launch you know, into the part of the field that doesn't have the trees and the auto launch will take off. And then if I'm doing a return to home, it's going to circle over my head or maybe in the older versions with the offset. But as it comes down, it's going to hit a tree. With safe home, you can store a position like in, in the field that's next to you that's massive, that's loads of room, that may be bigger than your loiter radius would probably be handy. But it means that, the, that in an event of a problem, the fixed wing vehicle can go there and uh, it's a lot safer for it to come down and it's not going to be a problem. Now, you can store multiple ones of these, can't you, Pavel? 
Yes, uh, if I remember correctly, you can store up to seven safe homes. And when you arm your, this, because this apply not only to the fixed wing, but also to the multi rotors. When you arm your UAV, your ACE, I don't know how this is thing, those, those things are really called. The INAV picks the closest one to you. So uh, if you know, if you have a, even a several places when you fly around, you can just uh, configure the same home for every of those uh, popular things. And INAV will automatically pick the, uh, the best place to land your aircraft. That is a massive deal. That is reason enough for me because I have a place over in Yorkshire. I have a place over here in Cheshire. I can put a couple of safe points around in each of those and the plane will automatically go to the one that's nearest yes, if something yes, goes exactly wrong. exactly like that. Brilliant. Um, improvements to return to home and waypoint handling. Is there anything we need to talk about there apart from the fact it works better? Uh, it's better, it's smoother and uh, it should give you nicer experience and that's all. Fantastic. Next big deal is uh, you guys have been quite clever in that if you use the DJI goggles, uh, I did a whole video on it, I'll put a link below, that talks about how the DJI goggles work. The telemetry is sent to the goggles and the goggles create the on-screen display. iNav has to emulate beta flight multi wee serial protocol yes. in order for it to work. Come on, DJI. You've been dragging your feet on this for too long. But... The, the, the iNav guys have managed to figure out a way to get even more information on our screens, even though they're going to maintain compatibility with the DJI system. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because for me as a DJI pilot, this is another one of the reasons I'm going to upgrade. Uh, yes, uh, right now iNav 2.6 has an ability to reuse the craft name field, which works. Uh, as a text string to render some additional elements on your goggles. So not only you can display warnings uh, because there is no system messages field uh, like we have in the like in the analog OSD. You can display warnings. You can display distance to home and few other uh, options that are fully configurable, well, almost fully configurable. And uh, you do all of that by just uh, storing the correct name of your craft, starting with the one of the characters i do not remember all the details right now but it's in the documentation if you want a little bit more information there's something you've been desperate to have in your screen display there's a chance you can get it now uh there's yes. a new azimuth is that how you pronounce it azimuth on screen display element yes. um so th this is if you're flying far away and you're looking to see how far the model has deviated away from the ideal path for long range narrow antennas this will kind of give you an idea of where you are which is great if you're a long range pilot another big reason for you if you're long range to go to 2.6 and uh, a last little one the air flight mode has been removed from the on-screen display which is great it's just the one that's there when you go into acro and things like that the air is the kind of the default one that tends to pop up air mode on. is not really a, a air mode it's not a mode it's just a way that that everything works below the hood so, so those are kind of the headlines. However, there is one big one missing out that, isn't there, Pavel? And that is that the multi-rotor stuff has been completely yes. overhauled. Can you talk a little bit about this? Because a lot of the detail, the listed things that have changed, all like the um, unicorn filters and things like that correspond to all this goodness for multi-rotors. Uh, yes, the, the changes for the multi-rotors are rather quite extensive because they apply not only to the PID loop, but also to the default filtering and our recommendation as how to set up your filters. Um, because on one hand, we caught up to what Betaflight offers uh, because we introduced uh, additional setting for the PID loop called the control derivative, which is the equivalent of the Betaflight feed forward. Right. You might ask why we haven't called this a fit forward uh, because it's not fit forward. It's really complicated. It's a lot about uh, being very strict <laughs> about how you should name stuff and right. the control theory. But bottom line is that better flight fit forward is not really a fit forward. And to avoid the confusion between uh, this this fit forward for the multi rotors and the fit forward for the fixed wings because they are completely different, mm -hmm. we decided just to name it slightly in a slightly different way. Uh, so this changes and this allows us to handle the D terms much better. If you know anything about tuning your PID, you should you should know that if if you are able to handle the term better, you are almost golden. Uh, on top of that, we got rid of some of the 
filters and uh, as the almost the cooperation with the team of the emo flight we also ported the kalman filter from the emo flight to INAV, which to be honest let's gives pretty 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 amazing results in in, in flight and uh, this also made the rpm filtering on the INAV something that we say we do not really say that you should use rpm filters if you want to you can uh, but still the default tune for the multi rotors and INAV is not to use rpm filtering but to use the kalman filter and uh, matrix filter together with all the small improvements under the hood so bottom line if you're a multi-rotor pilot and you want to get a better uh, feel from your multi-rotor then 2.6 is definitely going up to i noticed yes. some improvements yes. in 251 252 uh i'm excited to see what 2.6 is like because if it's you... a it's ongoing process it's ongoing process we are every release try to to put something there and my final advice do not restore your settings if you're on the multi-rotors from 2.5 uh, start from the defaults and tune from the defaults because really we changed a lot and restoring your old settings might just not give you the advantage of the new 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 improvements uh, in the in the in INAV. fantastic thank you pavel so let me just run through the list very quickly so there's a um, new receiver protocol the compass calibration has been improved the smoother autonomous flying on multi-rotors cruise waypoint and return to home uh, there's also improvements for things like the how um, the throttle is handled on fixed wing from transitions um, and things like that as well. So there's lots of those kind of cute things. Um, the safe home stuff we've talked about. Global function and logic conditions we need to talk about yes. a little bit. Now, I did a video with your support yes. a while ago. Yes. That video is now no longer useful. Uh, some of the ideas uh, no, behind it, is. it. No, it is. It is useful. Well, it is useful, Lee. You well, only have to move well, that... your functions from the global functions to the logic conditions. <laughs> yeah, but everyone's going to watch it and go, my, my screen doesn't look like that. So we might end up doing it again. <laughs> but what it means now is, yeah, as Pavel's just explained, it's all in one place. But, they, but there's a lot more functionality has also been added to the logic conditions yes. and global function stuff. So, for example, you can do things like you can change your own screen display now with logic conditions. You can also display uh, different items within the on-screen display driven by logic conditions. So logic conditions before were very much uh, the initial implementation, uh, if, if you don't mind me saying, was a little clunky, but it was a great way to kind of have logical switches turning and making things happen. This time round it's a lot more sophisticated which why i think we'll end up doing another video because it, the stuff you can do <laughs> is so for example you um, whereas before you know we were trying to do automatic video transmission power increases mm -hmm. and step them up now there's a way in the logic conditions where you can actually tell i nav i want you to calculate the 3d distance not just the distance yes. how far away i am but also take into account my height and now that means that if you are allowed if it's legal in your area, to fly a mile above your head, then INAV will still, even though you're right above you, will kind of take that into account and you can... So there's some really cool stuff. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you've... Because this is something that I know you, you've been involved in. Uh, can you talk a little yes, bit about that's, it? Because this, this that's is my something baby. close to my heart. <laughs> That, that's my baby. That's right. my baby. Uh, no, the, the, maybe let me explain why the global functions are gone. Uh, because at one point I realized that the global functions are logic conditions. And when I decided to, for example, add the second argument for the global function, I discovered, but whoa, this is a logic condition now. So why, why to keep it separated? So I just moved it to the to the other file uh, in INAV. Um, Originally, global logic, logic uh, conditions were only to drive servos, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, quickly me and also other people that started using this uh, functionality discovered that you can do so much more. Uh, for example, you can set up your own mixer for the trucked vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, it was never really intended to do it, but uh, whoa. You can do it, so why not, why not to, to reuse it? This is why uh, we are 
trying to improve it and uh, with every release there is uh, even at least uh, a few of those parameters requested by the community. That 3D distance is, uh, by the way, one of them. Uh, we are not stopping there. May I share what I'm planning for 2.7 and the logic conditions? <laughs> Go for it. Absolutely. You heard it here first, I'm, people. I'm for, I'm, for example, planning to add user configurable general purpose PID controllers. Okay. So you will be able, yeah. So you'll be able to control whatever you want based on whatever you want, and as well to override the RC channels. So you will be able to do your own even sh small maneuvers based on the logic conditions. Activate the flight modes, limit yourself uh, with the distance, uh, or anything you really want. If you are brave enough to try to override your radio channels. Fantastic. That sounds. Yeah. That's definitely going to be one of those things that in through the rest of 2021, you're occasionally going to get a video from me, probably with a lot of Pavel's help, uh, explaining how stuff happens in 2.6 and 2.7. This is the issue. <laughs> when, when you give people like me something like logic conditions and global functions, and this is what happens with OpenTX, you just, you immediately, it's like it's like giving you all the, all the building blocks, and then suddenly, you know, you've built this Lego castle out of these little plastic blocks, and you think, well, actually, that wasn't what we meant, but okay. Uh, yes, and I'm, and I'm sure exactly. you this know, situation. It, it's fine because you know it's, one of the simple things you could do is you could initiate a return to home of using logic conditions when the battery gets to a certain level. You can initiate return to home if you went over a certain three D distance away from you. There's low, very basic stuff, but I'm sure we'll end up doing some funky stuff too. So thank you for for that. For me, that that is really exciting, and it's one of those that I can see myself making lots of videos on. Uh, we talked a little bit about the on-screen display. Again, I'm skipping over a few things here. F port 2 is supported, which is good. Uh, one shot 125 is now the default ESC protocol, which kind of makes sense. Um, improved OSD CMS PID mechanics. Uh, next big one I think is worthwhile talking about, improved crossfire support, SNR LQ alarms. Yes. So in, ter in terms of how iNav understands the telemetry from, from crossfire yes. and probably yes. tracer, because the crossfire engine is the same. This is the same. It, yeah, it's the same. So, so do, do you have you got any more detail on that as a crossfire pilot? Again, that could be a reason for me to want to upgrade on on particular models. Uh, this is one more time something that really improved the the support for the for the crossfire because previously I only could read the RSS chair, RSSI or mm -hmm. the link quality if it was injected as one well of the channels. However, the crossfire injects this data as one of the telemetry frames and with the changes you can display your signal to noise ratio link quality rssi also i think transmitter power in the osd and also configure even alarms for the link quality on the osd without having to inject anything uh, into the any, any of the rc channels and if you are a long branch pilot this is something that you will be definitely happy about yeah, so that along with the azimuth the stuff uh, for the on-screen display, yes. if you if you like one of those guys that's like to fly multiple tens of kilometers away, um, you're going to love that stuff. Uh, obviously, if it's legal. If you understand what so. azimuth is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there is a lovely diagram in the documentation. Uh, although I saw in the documentation they're still using your same hand-drawn diagram. I think you did it for the for for how uh, safe home works. Yes. Uh, that was brilliant. I was like, oh, that looks like Pavel's handwriting. And the how how old is that <laughs> diagram? But it's still it still works right uh, there is a, a well we're talking about dji on screen display we've talked a little bit about that if you're a dji pilot 2.6 has some big uh, benefits for you it also now adds uh, esc imu and barrow temperatures so if you want to keep an eye on things like if you have the telemetry from your escs what your esc temperatures are you can have that um also um, Mavlink telemetry compatibility for OpenHD. Um, I'm probably going to be doing something with OpenHD in 2021, um, but OpenHD relies on Mavlink, which is the telemetry you tend to find on things like Ardu mm -hmm. Copter and Ardu Plane, and it's great to see that that has been um, kind of revved so it is compatible with OpenHD. Is that something that you've been involved in? or No, not really. So I only know it happened, but unfortunately that's all. Cool. Um, again, going on to nice stuff that's in here for fixed wing, uh, turn assist, pitch gain for coordinated turns. So for uh, tailless airplanes, for flying wings, things that I love in particular, my Drax, my Blackhawks, um, that's going to make things smoother along with some of the other tweaks. Um, 
and uh, support for additional MSP based bits and pieces. Um, and basically, if you're so, so what we've basically said, if you're a fixed wing pilot, if you're a multi rotor pilot, if you are a long range pilot, if you are a DGI <laughs> HD pilot, it's worthwhile. Yes. So that's pretty much yes, it is. That's pretty much everybody. Oh, yes, it is. No, definitely it is. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so I think that's most of the list. There's only a couple of things because um, for those of us who are actively involved in the project, the way it works is that just to explain, if you if you don't spend all your time looking in GitHub, again, I've got a video on how to look at GitHub and watch what's going on. It's fascinating seeing how people like Pavel and the rest of the developers work for free. Don't forget to hit the donate button for things like this, guys, seriously, because we get all the benefit and uh, we don't give them any money, right? They just do it for, they do it for the love and um, let's let's give a little bit of love back. Um, I've been a Patreon of Iron Now for a very long time. Um, but the, the, the really cool thing is if, if you go and watch in GitHub, you can actually see all the things come in and you can ask for stuff. If yes, you, you can. You can ask yes, for stuff. If right? you are nice enough, maybe even someone will do it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, 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 I'm not obviously asking nicely enough because the three that I've asked for are still in the future. But the only one that I that I'm really excited about that I haven't and hopefully two point seven. I'm just going to you know kind of you know put my flag on that on that particular hill um, was be the automatic setting of trims for level flight for fixed wing models. Um, and then I've been flying in manual and with really good, well set up models that are trimmed well, that have the central gravity in the right place, manual is the way to go. Acro is handy if there's a bit of wind, but on a calm day, manual is just epic. And one of the things that I always do is that it, it always takes me a flight or two to kind of do the auto trim, the servo auto trim. And I ask for that to be an automatic thing that the plane does because uh, because it should know what level so you just fly straight and level and then you say this is what level is and the plane goes right gotcha and trims it but 2.7 i'm hoping for uh, there are, there's only two or three things in this there's lots of things that's really interesting and thank you for kind of going through that hopefully if you've been listening some of that stuff has caught your attention and hopefully you realize now some of the benefits depending on what camp you're in so the the other stuff i'm really excited about is that there are some big changes in the on-screen display you can display the first four global variables in the on-screen display so that means you can have whatever you want in there as well so if for the analog pilots it's not just dgi stuff that gets all the new toys the analog guys do too and the on-screen display that we normally only ever go into to access the video transmitter channels to change the the the, the band and the channel that we're using so we don't step on our mates is completely revamped in 2.6 there is an awful lot of stuff in there about the mixer the type the servo tables all that stuff is in there and again that's not really broken out in the list so if you're using 2.6 i would heartily recommend spend a bit of time go into the on-screen menu and actually have a look through all the stuff that you've got access to. You will probably be able to do stuff at the field that normally, before 2.6, you would have needed a laptop for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that that was something that kind of slipped in a little bit, the, on, the, the menu being revamped and made a lot beefier than it used to be. Uh, I, I think the reason for that is that developers hate to write documentation. <laughs> 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 no, uh, that's that's right. the reality. Okay. Uh, no, um, I, we know that ultimate goal is, for example, something that uh, race flight one or flight one or however th this thing is called one Falco Falco X uses when you can set up everything about your model, including ports, uh, protocols for the radio and so on. Uh, however, this is, let's say, unrealistic for now. But with INAV 2.6, you can do more if, for example, you want to tune your craft on the airfield. Uh, because getting this thing uh, to your car or a table, plug into your laptop and then finding if the configurator is running, it's kind of irritating. While the, the things that you are usually do during the tuning, you can just uh, turn on with your transmitter in your goggles. You only have to touch down somewhere, open the stick command to, to for the for the setup and start changing your tune uh, on airplane or, or the multi-rotor, just not to waste too much time. 
Yeah, fantastic. It is one of those things again. I think that should have been in big red letters in the in the update file because that that was a surprise because it was only when I started forgot. playing. Hmm? We forgot. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pavel's been exceptionally honest on this one. I do love it. Uh, and the last couple of things I'm excited about: the logic conditions now give me more toys to play with, so I'm, I'm going to push the envelope more. So you know. Thank you for that. And the last thing that I, as a fixed wing pilot, love is the safe home stuff. I think that is just such a fantastic idea. It means that I can actually try and get it to circle over a safer place than I may launch it from because I might be at the edge of the field when I launch it and it sends, sends the home location. I might be able to push a couple of hundred meters out, but there might be a field to the left of me, which is, you know, 20 acres in size. That's where I want it to come and down. That's far away brilliant. from your car. Yes. People, pets, and property ideally need to be as far away from an automated landing because the automated landing, from what I understand, looking at the documentation, it's still how it's always been. Again, with your beautiful diagram, yes. so it, it isn't a very smart automated landing. It's kind of a controlled spiral into the ground. Um, so you definitely want a lot as much room as you can. Pavel, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate. Uh, just all the effort that you're putting into this and also just for being a pal this year i really appreciate all the time and effort and coming back to me on my stupid questions when i'm trying to do something dumb and i go how does this work and it usually is because i have misunderstood something and you've been incredibly patient so thank you so much i'm looking forward to 2021 flying with a lot more with INAV 2.6 and looking forward to 2.7 Make sure you subscribe to Pavel's channel. I'll put links down below uh, because Pavel is doing updates all the time on what's going on. And as more of us come into the INA family, uh, it's great to kind of keep up to date with how all this stuff works. Because if I, who've been an INAF pilot from the very, very early days, back when it was you know a, a, a gps test bed for clean flight uh I can get confused about how some stuff works some of you newer pilots who are in inav i'm pretty much guarantee will try and do some of this stuff and get stuck and pavel is great at explaining it in detail so make sure that you subscribe to him and again last comment is if you are using inav and you're enjoying it do hit the donate button or become a patreon uh just put a couple of bucks these guys way uh, we use the technology it costs us absolutely nothing to use and it provides hours and hours and hours of fun and enjoyment so again thank you pavel thank you everybody have a fantastic you, christmas and i will uh, see you all again in the new year no doubt best wishes everybody thanks a lot thanks a lot bye 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 Thank you for watching my video and watching right to the very end. If you want to find out what I'm currently working on, you can follow me on social media by searching for Painless360 in the usual places. If you'd like to become part of the inner circle, then you can become a Patreon. Details are in the description and you get lots of additional benefits. Check out the playlist section on the channel too. I organize all of my videos into playlists and it's called something like Introduction to or for Beginners. All of the content is aimed so that you can start at the very beginning and it teaches you that subject, starting with simple principles and moving up to teach you everything you need to know.